Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Words Out Loud. This is our second of three Sunday afternoon readings this year, Poetry and Prose, uh, dovetailing with the Art of the Kent exhibit backstory just down the road. I'm Mary Elder Jacobson, and even though she doesn't want me to say it, my co-organizer is Allison Evans, who is that lovely lady in white when you walked in with programs. Uh, we're so grateful to be here at the Old West Church and incredibly thankful for her team of caretakers. Last week at the reading, the steeple was down on the ground, cradled in scaffolding, having spent the entire summer there um, being worked on by uh, professional expert steeple restorers. And this Wednesday, it was lifted up by crane and is now back home sweet home on top of the church. Um, and I don't know how much it cost when any of you had to repair your 1823 meeting house steeple, <laughs> but it costs a pretty penny. And so if you would like to help out in any way, leave a donation as you leave in a basket, or if you would like to write a check later, there are envelopes and an address um, to contribute to the ongoing repairs that will be needed to keep the steeple in top shape and this building as beautiful and long lasting as it is. Uh, for close to 200 years, this building has remained pretty much unchanged with no electricity. So there is no microphone, despite what you think. <laughs> I often thank authors for coming all the way they have to share their work. But really, when I say that, I don't just mean traveling all the way from towns like Middlesex and Bristol. I mean coming all the way to poetry. Our first reader today is George Longenecker. His book, Star Root, is a kind of time capsule. A time capsule in which he has placed events and observations from history, from family before him, from moments in his own time. And these stretch from early childhood to boyhood to adolescence through to maturity. From a boy's daydreams involving superheroes to a love of impulsive adventure, a passion for nature, a devotion to long and abiding love. Reading the poems in this collection, we come across reflections rising from his and our collective place on earth, a mere dot on the timeline, as well as among other realms, space, the planets, stars. George Longenecker's time capsule is not a skewed sampling of life. His writing is sincere, and he looks in every corner he touches on pain as well as pleasure, the ugly as well as the beautiful, sadness and humor, our griefs along with our gifts. In one poem, I don't know if he's going to read it today, but it's a very complex favorite of mine called Diptych. He writes, sanity demands we forget, and also, but humanity demands we remember. Star Root is one man's time capsule of poems addressing humanity. Please welcome George Longenecker. Thank you, Mary, for that introduction. And, and thank you, Allison, and all of the volunteers. And thank you for the steeple. I'm so honored you put it back for our reading. <laughs> Mary's introductions are little poems in themselves, and, and I'm honored. Also, thank you, Carla, who will be following me in a few minutes. I was at one of these readings a couple of years ago, and if you look through the windows, there are the old wavy glass, and I had to write this poem. It reminded me of my own house, house where I used to live in Marshfield. Distorted glass. Where we lived then, some of the old window panes were rippled. 
We look through blue-green water and lilacs and cosmos. In winter, we look through ice, everything white, gray, and frozen. We had a baby then. Some days, winter sun, low in the south, made rainbows on wide, worn floorboards. Our daughter crawled to catch colors. Then there were dark days, ice upon ice. We looked at each other from either side of distorted glass, neither one really seeing the other. It was dark by four as windows leaked cold air. On windy nights, thumb latches rattled, answering mice in the walls. Some things have to be fixed if you want to survive winter, not hide with your child under quilts. It took us three years, but we replaced the windows, clear glass with no icy drafts. Sometimes I wish I'd kept one of the window panes. In the morning, I'd look at fragmented iris, their purple scattered, scattered here and there, or an icy rain, or even at you in a different light. Not that I'd really want to go back, except maybe to see our child crawling after rainbows on the floor. Bear Lake. Just three lights shine on the opposite shore. At ten, the waxing moon is only a dim sliver. Sky still too bright to see stars. White pelicans fly low over water, wings beating slowly. So close, I hear their feathers against air. As I fall asleep, they're still flying. All night, the Milky Way brightens the sky from Idaho south to Utah. A plane blinks red. A single satellite moves east to west. All the rest is stars. In desert sky shine stars light years old. Eons from now, somebody may be watching our star. By then, we'll probably be gone. Maybe we'll have blown ourselves away. It's hardly important to the Milky Way whether our star shines or not. Twilight comes by 4 a.m. Across the light, a porch light blinks on. Already the Milky Way is floating into dawn. Already one white pelican flies low over Bear Lake. All the rest is stars. Down will come baby. Back when the world was half lava, half ice, I descended to earth, already a religious boy, landed in Salem. But I was not a witch or a Puritan, just a child born in a hospital. I know I heard music from my black bassinet, Frank Sinatra, Count Basie, Doris Day, the doxology, Mother Goose lullabies, but these words I can't get out of my head. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall, and down will come baby, cradle and all. It takes a boy a long time to grow young. I learned to dance before I walked, waited for my fall. Year by year, I lost the wisdom of youth. I climbed a tall sugar maple to escape my parents, who dragged me to our Ford, locked me in the back seat, and drove me to church, where I learned my fall was coming. <laughs> After school, I climbed that tree's topmost branches, or shot lifted plastic B-57 bombers and live hamsters from Woolworths. After all, I was a religious boy who knew my fall was coming. So what the hell? 
I should do something religious. Like <laughs> Any of you have been in this pulpit, you, know, you feel so omnipresent and ministerial. <laughs> Breathing in moonlight, we sit on the stern of a sailfish on the beach, one boat in a row of rentals whose masts pierce the dusk. The moon has sliced the sea, ships' lights float on the horizon. From down the beach, a fisherman's headlamp cuts the dark as he climbs up the beach hauling a cart with his rods and catch. Fifteen fish. Sorry about the light, he says. I'm not sorry about the light or anything tonight, sitting here on a beach sailing skiff with fifteen fish pulled in moonlight from the sea. Florida moonlight pulls us in, back to salt water from which we came. But we couldn't breathe under sea any more than those fish could use gills on land. There will come a night when I'll no longer breathe next to you. But not tonight. But sit on the sailboat's stern until the moon touches her mast. Fragmented childhood. I watched Laurel and Hardy say goodbye again and again in a perfect day, waving and waving in black and white, but never able to get on the road. Nights I couldn't sleep because I was afraid of huge black birds lurking outside my window. At school we hunched under our desks for air raid drills. In an atomic blast, we were told, our classroom windows would blow inward. I couldn't finish my spelling book. After the drill, all I saw was fire and glass. My, my parents fed me well, but I needed somebody to take me, somewhere, anywhere. I don't know why I wanted to leave, but walking away seemed safer. Oh, I wanted to say goodbye. I escaped into my stamp collection, Montenegro, Angola with its elephants and giraffes, San Marino with its castles and turrets. I wandered with wolves and bears as I read Nomads of the North. Then I ran away. In my pockets, two books, 50 cents, my six favorite marbles. I walked and walked until it snowed wet flakes on pines where I hid, under drooping boughs so cold that I finally gave up and walked home. Maybe I didn't want to say goodbye. Maybe I only wanted someone to look for me. I returned to my stamps and Superman comics, content to fly off to Metropolis or San Marino. Maybe I was just looking for a little light or warmth. One day, the next spring, I lit a grassy field of fire. <laughs> Yard sale. A house can be haunted by those who were never there. Louis McNeese. Under an awning away furnishings, exposed and alone without the house, which has been emptied of the maple table where the first sun shone each day on coffee cups and warm silver spoons, emptied of oak four-posted bed, where for 50 years two people loved and awoke each day, of matching bureau whose drawers held socks and underwear, the house is empty of the cradle where children first slept, empty of carpets, chairs, knives, spoons and forks, mops and clocks. Window panes reflect bare floors. Signs advertise the sale. Furnishings sit while two curious crows swoop overhead while the empty house waits. The clocks 
Tempo time. Car doors slam as the yard sale begins. Crows call once, twice, circle over. Soon the oak bureau, maple table, bed, cradle, and clocks are gone. All that was there is gone. Inside the house is too quiet, too bright. Who I thought would be history soon, but uh, unfortunately they're still in the current events category. <clears throat> Salt and Sorrow. A kitchen in a residence in Aleppo, Syria, damaged Sunday in fighting. Narcisco can trace this photo. The New York Times. Walls are blackened. There's a refrigerator with rust at its bottom, stickers of yellow butterflies and blackbirds on its door. A dish towel hand hangs on the door handle, and atop sits a vase of purple paper flowers. On shelves, <clears throat> jars of spices still stand, stand upright. We can't see what's upright in the rest of the home if its power is on or if walls and windows are intact. Charred ceiling plaster covers the floor. No mortar shells or shrapnel, though. A jar of beans lies unbroken, and a tiny drawer, maybe for salt. But we don't know. We know nobody can live without salt or sorrow, no matter where. On a lower shelf rest three small pairs of sneakers. We can't see the children, the parents, or the photographer. They must all be somewhere, outside. But outside is not in the picture. We can't hear if there are explosions and artillery fire. On the wall hang pans, a strainer, and measuring spoons. Why do some things fall and not others? All the utensils are blackened, but we can't tell whether from cooking or just war. In a dish drainer, cups dry. They'll need to be washed again if the family returns, if they live. Their blackened kitchen sent naked around the world. Nest. Wrap me in your wings. Hide me high in a white pine. Weave me a nest with your beak. Line it with downy feathers. Sew it with fine threads of nettle. Twine it with silk of milkweed. Cushion it with pussy willows. Braid it with milk of moonlight. Let me feel warm breath in your beak. Let me feel your heart beat against my breast. So when I first met Cynthia, who's been my, my wife for over 30 years, she was living down here on the Bliss Pond Road. And, and at that time, instead of having just road numbers for rural mail, uh, the contract routes were called star routes. Bus, the title of this book, Star Route. She lived on the Star Route, Bliss Pond Road, her dented rural mailbox, one of two on the corner by a sugar maple. Let me kiss you, she said. I missed my turn and drove all the way to Libra. November stars flared between black branches. Somewhere between Bliss Pond and Orion, I turned and followed the right star home. <laughs> Let me kiss you, she said, and I stayed longer. Some nights we still spread our wings and fly west, past Orion, wings tip to tip, Libra to Pisces, along the star route, up over the Pleiades. Blue stardust sparks in her eyes. 
Let me kiss you, she says, and we swoop so low over the pond that our feathers touch stars in the water. This next one really requires three short dedications. It's titled Rain Taxi. It's a tribute to the journal Rain Taxi, which is a beautiful uh, review of books out of, out of Minnesota. Check them out online. And, and uh, <clears throat> the epigraph is uh, a line from The Fugs. Um, Ed Sanders was the lead singer of The Fugs. And, you know, 50 years ago, he's still around. He's one of the I see people my age not. <laughs> Fugs fans here. Uh, <laughs> can't even find the line online. Uh, he's one of the most enduring musicians and poets, half, half a century as a poet, historian of music and poetry. And it's also dedicated to the late poet George Mapon, my dear friend and, and collaborator who passed on last year. Rain Taxi. Soft music down a windy street, worn smooth by light years of frustration and traffic, the fogs. Two red oak leaves stuck to the side window of an old checker cab, headlights reflected in dark puddles. The old Hancock Tower's weather light glowed red for rain, and from a higher building a beacon revolved in the night. Horns of boats in the harbor echoed through streets where water splashed up from gutters, ran down the sidewalk. There on the corner, I thought I saw you with your bag of poetry books, pens, first drafts. A stoplight glowed red in a puddle. And when my cab finally moved ahead, you were gone. Of course, I should have known it couldn't be you. We wouldn't write any more poems together. I'd seen you die on the first day of spring. I forgot where I was going in all this rain. I didn't know why the streets were so wet, why this cab was so old. I forgot what you had been writing about the last time we were together. A rain taxi crossed rivers of streetlights. And one last poem. It doesn't matter much on Jupiter. You wake me to see Jupiter so bright, aligned with four more planets, Saturn, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. When the moon sets, those other worlds glow. All night, barred owls call back and forth from palms and pines. Breeze off the Everglades brushes our skin like moth wings, carries scent of mud from mangrove swamps. So far to Jupiter, yet the planets tonight are as close as our bodies on this blanket where we lie three feet above sea level. Palm fronds tick in the wind. For a while, owls still call as clouds turn pink. It doesn't matter much on Jupiter that Earth's polar ice melts or Florida slips under sea. Planets and stars fall to the horizon. A storm blows on Jupiter older than all of our history. Love, I hope we can survive for one more night. Thank you.
and she has brought with her today her brand spanking new chat book that she's gonna, among other things, read from. It's called Fragments from the Lost Book of the Bird Spirit, and it's really freshly out. Carla Van Fleet moves between visual and literary arts. In her books, which I didn't bring up here, but she'll show you, uh, she has paintings and poems, and they're kind of in conversation with one another, um, which made me think about conversation and spaces between. When we're in conversation with others, ever notice how you say something and someone might say, I hear you, I hear you. And what they mean is, I'm connecting with your feelings. And sometimes when we're leaving, we say, keep in touch. And we mean, let's stay connected even when we're apart. In much of Carla's work, she moves between what we can touch and what we can't, between the tangible and the intangible, all while staying connected. I was thinking of this metaphor before I found this line in one of her poems, and when I found it, I was like, wow. Uh, <laughs> and the line is, my celloed body resonates. My celloed body resonates. When a string player uses her bow to make moving contact with the strings on a violin or a bass or a viola or a cello, you may have seen this before, when we hear the sounds, and when the bow is not touching the strings, what we hear is silence. Or is it? Sometimes the musician will finish with a pull of the bow across the strings just before lifting it carefully. <clears throat> her bow paused in midair as her body language signals that we too are to pause. It says, don't clap yet. The strings are still reverberating. The music now living somewhere between full sound and complete quiet. What sings to us then is something in between. It may not be melody, but it is not silence. It resonates, it's another energy. In much of her work that I've read, Carla Van Vliet sounds like the careful listener who notices the spirit residing between sound and quiet. Please welcome Carla Van Vliet. sometimes buying books, and also letting poetry touch your hearts. It's, I think, the job of poems. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from my first two books and then showcase my new poem-length chapbook, and then I'm going to end with a couple of new poems. I just say that, I don't know, to give you all a map, <laughs> to give myself a map for this reading. Can you all hear me? I'm going to check in. Okay. I'll try to find that deeper place here. Iris open. Irises open their tight blue hearts in a day. This is how I remember it. The dark of birth unbolts, like thunderclouds or starlings breaking into air. This is how the heart breaks, not into pieces, but into blue tongues. A kind of grace in this disregarding world. Blue tongues and at their center, a yellow star. First bird. I laid the moon in the darkness of my hand, my body 
is the mystery. Take what you will. It is an offering, the water's psalm, the, the damp earth bored into. This is the way to find me. Listen, the first bird has called out, I am here, I am here. There is nothing new. Light will soon open the east. Love, 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 there is still time. In hands. This is the way it goes. Bird rising through rain, the sigh of wind-bent grass. Look here, your touch on my reaching hand. This too can be love. Rain falling, the earth catching it like an oak. This um, book from the Book of Remembrance is a collection of, there's a, there's a painting on one side and a poem on the other. The poems are called Post, Post something, um, all from maybe um, a post from a time, space, feeling, something like that. Um, and I'm gonna read two of these. Post from my kitchen. It is dinner time, and I am cooking in my kitchen. I imagine you come up behind me. I think to say the moon is but a sliver and holds the sky like your hand on my hip. Of course you do not hear me, you at your own stove two states away. I think the sandhill cranes have come back again, four summers now. I think of their wings held to a shape of a crescent. I think if I were a crane, I would leave these burgers to burn. I would fly east toward your long wooden table, my wings like two napkins flapping, the sound they'd make like smacking lips. Post from the Book of Remembrance, Storms Brink. The trees are dusk lit and rustle in the expectant storm. Birds fly low across the lawn, their shadows rising and falling along the grass like stitches. I stand at the door, watch the clouds gather over the lake, roll across the valley. The sutures of trepidation cinch the air. At first, I hear just a rumble, a far off train, or a truck coming down the road, or fireworks out at Basin Harbor. But then, as if insisting itself, the air splits, ripping echoes off the mountain at my back. This is how it feels to love you, the sharp edge of need cutting the air a fierce slitting. I have written a thousand love poems to you, but never have I let you this close. I'm standing in the whipping wind. <coughs> um, you may have noticed I, I write a lot about birds. <laughs> they just slide in there. Um, this is um, my new book, Length Chapbook, which is just out from Folded Word Press, like the 1st of October, so pre, just out. Um, it's called Fragments from the Lost Book of the Bird Spirit. I wrote it in the form of fragmented ancient text, um, similar to an erasure poem, and uh, there's a play between text and silence. I loved what you said, Mary, about that. Um, and in this, in this poem, in this book, I play a lot with it. Um, part of that is the meaning that is uh, created out of what's just left on the page. Um, so within the book, there are eight books, and I'll read the titles of the books as I go through. You'll get the hang of it. <laughs> the Book of Tribulation. Wind swept over the waters in the body of a heron. All was quiet, but for the wings beat, like breath, each lift and cast. Devotion, 
born, born on my tongue. I, have, I was of one body, the water, and it was separate from yours. In the space between us, my first prayer, my longing song, how eerie the sound that rose to fill the void, heartbroken, amatory, I only wanted. Who am I crying out like a mockingbird this way and that? Will this song bring you back? This song? I don't know. Without you, I am an empty wood. I do not know my own. The Book of Bewilderment. Still the air, what rusty trill unsettles from the tree. I am listening for the direction of your next call, my whole body devout. The river's water, a glass of sky rounding the bend. I know you are the shy bird reluctant to sight. I know your sounding sifts through my emptied branches, furtive beating, echoes, the kingfisher's pitched flight. The Book of Hazards. I heard you first, arisen from the far pond, a low lift and drop of honking. Within memory asserted loss, your fine goose bodies long necked across the sky. Here I called out after you, take me, please, and lost all sense. I unburied the body of a hummingbird, its iridescent form turned peridot. I ground the stone to dust and spread it over my tongue. My words sprang wings and flew away. I dug another body out and this time caught my words, little clamoring lungs with a butterfly net. I hung a bamboo cage in my window and left those flapping urgencies to sing all night. I bled a vein of cruelty the book of suffering. Let me die, this anguish. I mean it, this pain that rises like a storm of black bodies, crows filling the sky. I am pitched toward darkness, let out like a slapping flag at half mast, such wind. The lamenting flock having landed in the hilltop trees humbles them, bends them to submission, my submission to this grief, this one grief. Lying on the edge of the cornfield, above, all is oblivion, endless and nothing. From somewhere beyond, I hear the thwack, thwacking of leaf on stalk. Time out of time. Five, or is it six, turkey buzzards glide, circles in their tottering flight, spelling a quietus to flesh. My bones turn white under the sun. Raven, raven, your hefty darkness, tethered to the pyre, spirit, O oh spirit, lift to sky, deepened blue, the drum sounds, wing beats. <coughs> Flame, the cry of smoke, carried on breath, on song, on ka, ka, ka into the night, dream into the other world, ablaze. Go up in tinder, lit, 
the body cindered coal, the body ash. Iridescent feather tithe, conscripted flight, pouched bones made relic, bound. <coughs> the Book of Salvation. I became the rain, I became the rain, this too is the loon song. Swallows all beat and lead and bank their fervent bodies spelling the air. What speech, what tongue? Grace, like a knife cutting God's voice into you, cutting the sky with swift shapes. I stand, pain and love the same, cerulean blue above me. I am walking the road that splits the fields. Sun streams through cloud-struck sky. In the after rain, all gleams, brilliant. Burdock and chicory cluttering the ditch, an apple tree. Some days you have to count your blessings. You have to wring out your sorrows and hang them in the gentle breeze. Today, the air all dirt and wetness smells like hope on the wire bluebirds. The Book of Summons. Russet rustling in the meadow, little woodcock in the singing grounds. Day is drawn to evening, shade of dusky blue. I stand sorrow hitched in my throat. What marvel, diligent forging set aside to exalted flight, sky-bound flash. Who, 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 who sings into dawn that question we all ask in the end. Who, who will love me, O oh, morning dove? O oh, soft body in the hand, little beating. The Book of Orientation. In the snow I see the body's impression, breast, wings. I kneel, touch the outline, the feather, the feathered imprint. So quiet here in this expanse of field, this narrow valley edged by Hawkback and Moncton Ridge. I look up to sky, the blue like held breath waiting, then clear, the bunting song over the bray, my own heartbeat meets. In the cold snow falls, Flickering red body, cardinal in the wild rose. You called and called from the leafless maple. Yes, I came out of the house, my breath a cloud in the stillness, and looked until I saw the red-tipped branch. Your blood body, like a prayer against all that threatens to harden tenderness. Faithful flame, I am grateful for the reminder. Now beyond the window, the rose hip, the rustling of your mate joining you in the branches. The Book of Restoration. I heard you speak in the language of your people, like water from the sky, Inside, the apple orchard shook awake, opened its branches to you, bright blaze, oreo, like blossoms harbinger of fruit, the kindle of your song. Through the cedars, the rattle of a sandhill crane, just these rare two taking the ancient road north, 
through the eastern mountains. I know what it is to follow a visceral path, worn into breath each draw, each deeply rooted. I tell myself it is a brave act, a radical trust to heed the summons. In my dream, I am your body, red-tailed and riding, the fierce air of a droning fiddle under my wings, sharp-eyed. I seek across the land what rustles in the reeds, sown in the wind, source of devotion, sheer abandoned desire, the unhindered. Is this not my delight? Nothing separates this body from the thermal, or land, or from allegiance, this golden thread braided. Um, okay, so I'm going to read two pretty new poems. Um, the first one is called What Was Needed. And here's another bird for you. <laughs> what was needed. When we talk about the river, we should talk about the heron whose long wings lay shadow across the sandy bank. How the bird's hefty body rides air above the water. How like grief wings spread. What hope is it to bury bodies cradled in a swan's wing? What did the bereaved imagine 6,000 years ago when they laid out the infant and mother? A chariot of feathers to lift their spirits? Or for the wing to fold the dead ones close? I came to this river like I was coming home, and the river sat with me all day and night. Isn't it true that each of our hearts is broken in its own way? Mine needed the water's flow, the bird's fine feather and hollow bone. Um, this last poem is kind of an, um, an honor, uh, in honor to the Kent Museum because last year when I came to the fall show, I was, um, I was really taken by the beauty of the art and by a particular po uh, painting called Smoke by Stephen Lloyd. And this poem is an encrustic piece, a piece written out of my response to that painting. It's called Covetous, Covetous Heart, Covetous Heart. The morning you rose from my bed to wander through the field's tall grasses, as if you were a fox, flash of red fur or cardigan, I watched from the window and considered how the lifting fog caressed your skin. Yes, I stood at the curtained window and the fox of desire darted into the heavy forest of my bones. I must admit my lips craved the curve of your arm, your hip. You rose from my bed. It was early morning and I was not done with you. The woods that lined the meadow stitched the sky to ground. Your sleeves red like a blush, the sun's accent. When you turned to wave a gesture in dawn light. You wandered out of my bed, your feet bare in the dew-wet grass, left a trail I could see from the window, like an etching of your presence. The flame of your body and all around the mist rising. You rose from my bed, drawn by early morning's light and the mist that swirled in the breeze, a gesture beckoning, and you followed. Which, of course, is the flame of you I want to swallow, the very part of you that rises to the beckoning, the fox of you stepping into what is just awakening, your turn to see me watching, and your gesture for me to follow. Thank you very much.
thank you, George, and thank you, Carla, for coming all the way to poetry. Um, I hope some of you or all of you can join us down at the Kent um, for some refreshments and take in the backstory exhibit, which is running through October 7th. Um, and also check out the website for Art at the Kent. There's lots of wonderful events coming up. And next week, if you can come back for two really great personalities, um, we'd love to have you again. Thank you, and have a great afternoon.